Hi guys, Jonathan here with our weekly weapon. We have three laid out today, all closely related parts of the same family. Now this story is going to touch on various other rifles that I don't have here on the table today. Um, you'll be familiar with the two main rifles that I'm going to reference though. So, um, what, what are we looking at? So long story short, before I dive into to the whole story here, this rifle in the middle here is the Patton 1913. Now what might throw people off is how very close in uh, appearance this is to the Patton 1914, uh, a better known British rifle, and the model 1917, a very important and famous American rifle. And spoiler alert, they are all the same rifle. And this is the daddy, as it were. So this, this actual story starts in 1908, not with a rifle, but with ammunition and some fairly speculative trials to see if um, the already quite venerable um, 303 round could be modernized. Um, not specifically to make it rimless, although that did become part of the project, but to experiment with reducing the diameter of the bullet and increasing its velocity. Um, why would you do that? Well, it's part of a long trend throughout firearms history to make bullets lighter and faster. If you make them lighter, you can carry more of them, and you can also push them harder and faster and flatten trajectory out. So rather than a big heavy bullet doing this, you end up with a small fast bullet doing this. Why? Well, it's much easier to aim and hit what you're shooting at with a bullet that goes dead straight. Um, those of you who've played um, video games, standard, uh, the, the way bullets used to work, certainly in, in, in games, is that you, you fire and effectively a laser beam comes out and it tells the game where the bullet has hit in a perfectly straight line out to infinity. Well, that's ideally what you do with real guns. So that's kind of what they were looking at with this small caliber, high velocity um, project. Uh, they were looking at 0.256 of an inch, but also 0.276 of an inch. And it was that diameter of bullet, really quite small, that um, became this new experimental cartridge. Um, in parallel to that, from 1910 onwards, we had trials for a new rifle. And it's, you know, these two things go together. So um, the rifle trials are aware of the, the ammunition trials and vice versa. So the rifle actions for these experimental rifles had to be designed with a high pressure cartridge in mind. You can't get high velocity without increasing the pressure inside the chamber. So you need a really strong action. And although the old Lee Enfield, um, SMLE being the, the current variant of that action is perfectly strong enough for something like 303, for something like they were looking at, it wasn't going to cut the mustard. We also had some pretty vocal complaints um, following the Boer War where the, um, the Lee Enfield had, had come in for some serious criticism. Some of that was down to, or a lot of that actually, to be frank, was down to um, who was using it and in what situation. And that's military history, that's not my sphere to, to uh, stray into too far. Suffice to say, the, the kind of, the lesson they learned was that the Boer farmers, some of whom were expert marksmen, they, they were hunters apart from anything else, some of them had the latest German Mauser rifle, the Model 93, Model 96, um, that series that would be perfected with the Model 98. And so by this time, it's the 98 that uh, Imperial Germany um, has. And, and we can, can kind of see where things are going on the, on the um, uh, European stage. So we're also look, keeping an eye, as the Brits, on what the Germans are doing. So our recent enemy that was able to defeat us in, in some situations with an accurate modern flat shooting bolt action rifle. And then our immediate rival on the continent have got an even better version in theory of the same rifle. So we're looking at replacing the Lee Metford, Long Lee Enfield, and the latest variant of that, the short magazine Lee Enfield. But it's also recognized that the SMLE is also a really good rifle, short, light, handy, 
um, quick to bring into to action, quick to operate with a, a rapid bolt action, and it has 10 rounds on it. So certain lobbies, um, the target shooting, military lobby, who love to go and shoot their rifles at Bisley as well as in, on campaign, very keen on basically getting a Mauser and the government kind of wanting to get the best for the, for the troops effectively. So a lot of Mauser influence was going to come into this possible new replacement for the SMLE. So a War Office specification was issued. Um, this specification kept the length the and the weight of the SMLE, the idea of a universal rifle, so no carbines, everyone gets the same short rifle that was supposed to be kept as well. They liked the all-enclosed nose cap on the end of the SMLE that kept everything neat um, and, and compact. And they wanted to keep the same recoil energy and capacity of 10 rounds. So the first thing to look at is one of the prototypes of the P-13. So it's almost like a prototype of a prototype and really quite strikingly different from that um, fairly recognizable receiver bridge design with those quite complex long range target sites. We have no sights over this action at all. It's nice and smooth and we have slightly SMLE style sights in front of the action. But if anything, they're even more basic than the SMLE. Now, I don't know if that's because of the stage of development that this thing is at. Um, I believe this is technically a pattern 1912, by the way. There was a pattern 1911. Um, we have six pattern 13 series rifles in total. We only have two on the table. This one is serial numbered two, which is quite exciting. <laughs> um, but the star of the show really is a, a mashup. So they didn't stick with this just nicking the Mauser action, um, which incidentally is what the Americans did um, with the 1903 Springfield. Um, they ended up with a hybrid action between Enfield and Mauser. Although um, that's no slight to the Americans because we actually, the basis for this was not a Mauser, it was the pattern 1903 Springfield. We have that on record. So they copied this from the Springfield rifle that was copied from the Mauser. So it's all getting a bit incestuous here. So what I mean, what do I mean by hybrid Enfield Mauser? Well, this is the debate over cocking on closing versus cocking on opening. What does that mean? Well, this is debated back and forth even today, but the Enfield series of rifles were thought to be very quick to operate because they would open very readily and then you would use your, your sort of shoulder and your, and your arm to cock the rifle as you close it. So you've got to expend the energy somewhere, as it were, but it was thought to be quicker, and in my experience it is quicker, to have a rifle that cocks as you close the action. So it suddenly gets stiff as you press against the spring and then it, the gun is cocked as you close it. The Mauser works the other way around and cocks as you lift up the lever, which can, when the gun gets hot and dirty, slow it right down. And the geometry of the, the Enfield was set up for very rapid fire, which was used to such great effect in the opening months of the First World War. So despite the specification from a Mauser action, what they ended up doing was a Mauser bolt. This is almost identical to a Mauser bolt with an Enfield cock on close system. So it's got the twin strong lugs at the front, just like a Mauser, the big, long, thick and powerful extractor on the side of the bolt that's a feature of that design as well. Um, but it cocks when you close it, which was a feature that the Brits appreciated. The other thing, or noteworthy thing, and this carried through to the final P13, this one's very stiff by the way, is this cranked bolt handle. And the idea there is to put the handle just above the trigger. So for, for very quick action, you're straight off the trigger onto the bolt handle and you're pulling it up and you're pulling it back and it's going home. You're not hunting for it somewhere else. It's nice and quick. And again, we see that carried through onto the actual pattern 19. 13. And in fact, 
apart from that, apart from the sights which changed, which dictates the shape of the receiver, this is really quite close to the final P13. Um, the cocking piece is also on, on the prototype, funnily enough, it's more like an Enfield with a cocking piece you can manually cock. If, it, if the gun doesn't fire, you can manually recock it, or if you need to decock it, you can hold it. Those of you who've shot Enfields will know why they have those cocking pieces. The fully developed P13 has actually goes back to a conventional Mauser-shaped cocking piece um, striker that sticks out the back here. When you pull the trigger, it flies forward into this position. So quite an intriguing mixture of British and German features. Although the specification required an SMLE nose cap that with that, that iconic look, well, as you can see, the actual rifles didn't have that. They went for that um, Springfield style barrel sticking out the end of the nose cap which actually did increase the overall length of the thing by a good couple of inches. So, and the whole thing gained weight as well. So they didn't quite meet their specification by any means, but what they ended up with was an extremely effective and accurate rifle. The other thing that, that kind of went by the wayside were the extra five rounds. So, well, this one, this one actually has no magazine, this being a prototype. They hadn't got to the point of designing the magazine for this. Um, but during the course of development, it was decided that actually five, round, five rounds is perfectly good enough. And so we ended up with a Mauser-style magazine and a Mauser-style action with that Enfield twist. And of course, being British, we added long range volley sights so that you can shoot out to 2,800 yards um, rather than using a machine gun. Now, I'm being facetious, um, but that is a feature that came and went until the 30s, pretty much, or well, the sec Second World War, in fact. Another feature that was kind of contested was, um, were the finger grooves. So the Fully developed rifle, I, I believe this checking has been, was either an early experiment or was added later on, that's not quite clear. But on the troop trials rifles, so there were 1,251 troop trials, trials rifles made, so quite large scale trials in the field. Those had these diagonal finger grooves, which were not well liked and so were removed. So you will see pattern 13s in this collection and elsewhere with just smooth woodwork with no grooves at all. And then ultimately the decision was in favor of checkering. Um, and you'll see that on early um, P14s as well, which I'll, I'll, we'll come to in a moment. Of course, if you are developing an all new rifle, you need an all new bayonet, except the pattern 1913 bayonet, and this one is thick with grease, uh, preservative grease, is not an all-new bayonet at all. It's the exact same bayonet from the SMLE, even with a throwback to the hooked quillon, um, because this was originally a copy of the Japanese Arasaka bayonet with the same blade profile and the same guard. So there's a weird throwback where they put this back on, um, having already got rid of it quite early on on the SMLE bayonet. That gave rise to the obvious problem of, pe of people potentially trying to fit this bayonet to the old rifle. It wouldn't go because the end of the gun is completely different, even if the bayonet looks very, very similar. And that's why those of you who've come across pattern 1914 or M1917 rifles, their bayonets ended up with two grooves cut in to the wooden grips so that people wouldn't try and fit them to Lee Enfields. So if you've ever wondered, and I'm sure you haven't, why those bayonets have grooves on them, that's why. But, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And this bayonet was for a long time thought to be perfectly sufficient. So I suppose the, one of the major improvements from the prototype P13 to what would have been the production P13, if things hadn't gone awry, as I'm about to explain, is the, uh, the sights. So I mentioned the reprofiled body. Now that only exists to elevate and protect 
the sites and also to provide charger guides for five round clip loading as well. But the primary reason for this distinctive shape is to house the sights and those are excellent long range aperture sights where you pinch and slide from a low position, or a low um, closer distance to a further distance <laughs> in a very straightforward manner. Really well engineered, work really well, very accurate. And then folded down, we still have a larger battle aperture for close quarter or closer quarter work. Really excellent sights, really excellent rifle, um, superbly accurate. Now, unfortunately, although work on the rifles was going, um, if you'll forgive the pun, great guns, um, the ammunition, despite starting two years earlier, the ammunition project was in trouble. Although we had the American 30 6 cartridge around, um, well, since 1906, funnily enough, in that loading, um, not enough time had passed for Britain to effectively replicate something of that high pressure and high velocity, and certainly not with a smaller bullet. The, the whole sort of internal ballistics of that was rather different. So um, Britain just, uh, struggled to develop the right propellant and ran into serious problems with heating. Um, excessive muzzle flash and noise was reported from the trials rifles. Uh, barrels would wear out within a thousand, um, thousand rounds. Uh, chambers and barrels would wear excessively just from the, from the, the high pressures. I think we were probably having uh, metallurgical problems with the barrels as well as just um, not ideal propellants to try and generate these high velocities. Um, not super high velocities, um, 2,785 feet per second in, in old money, as it were, which isn't that much higher than 30 or 6, but um, nonetheless, Britain was uh, having serious trouble with this. Now, not insurmountable by any means. We were just perhaps a little bit behind the Americans on that, and I think probably we would have nailed it, but for a, a little thing called the First World War. So... Pattern 1913 is a clue. We'd adopted the rifle. We were trying to perfect the ammunition and then the First World War broke out. So what do you do? Well, like many nations with small arms programs underway, we parked it, but not entirely. This was a very sound rifle. Uh, we were already tooled up for it. So we put it into service again as the pattern 1914, sorry, into, um, notionally into service, I mean and then began to mass produce that rifle in 303, so the standard rimmed lower velocity, about 2,400 feet per second cartridge, with the idea that it could start to replace the SMLE anyway. Unfortunately, getting a brand new rifle into production alone was a huge task. Uh, they ran into all sorts of production issues with, uh, well, we had no capacity, so um, the Americans made them for us, three different uh, companies, that's a whole other story. So the pattern 1914 does not come, become significant until the Second World War. What is very significant though, and is really the ultimate legacy of the pattern 1913, is the US model of 1917, because more of those were in service with the United States in the First World War than the Springfield that it was ultimately based upon. Um, so a very significant design. And many of my peers and, and um, people that I talked to agree that this, the M1917 that is, with the 30 6 cartridge was the best infantry rifle of the First World War. And it's quite a hard one to argue. Got some of the best features of the Enfield, all the best features of the Mauser, and it's just a really fine rifle. Hey guys, thank you very much for watching as ever. And join us again next time for another one of these. Um, I'm over on the GameSpot channel as well, talking uh, nerdy stuff about guns and video gaming, so there is also that. Do have a look at the description. We have links th there to our website. Um, you can check out our social media and the various other things that we get up to over there. Um, and also, if you care to, we have links for donation and how you can become a member and support the Royal Armouries that way. Um, but otherwise, guys, just carry on watching with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot.